Lexi, thanks for reading. Let me tell you about a TV program that I watched about a year ago. It was called The Doctor Who Gave Up Drugs. I don't know if anyone else saw that. It was a TV doctor, celeb doctor, Chris Van Tulliken, and he was local to us here. He was in the East End of London, and he was trying to persuade GPs to prescribe fewer drugs. And um, I have no idea whether his advice was good advice medically. If you're on some prescribed drugs, please don't listen to me. The Guardian called it deeply flawed and an hour of shallow filmmaking. Um, but I loved it, which tells you how shallow I am. But um, I loved it not for the medical advice. I loved it for the people in it. Uh, Dr. Chris's point was that there are loads and loads of people taking loads and loads of pills that aren't really helping them, but that doctors keep on prescribing them because that is easier, and for one other reason. That was the, the kind of heart of the second episode. The heart of the second episode was a, a series of discussions with the doctors in the GP practice about whether the drug companies had bribed them or not. And uh, they said, no, 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 no. Um, it used to be like that, of course, when um, you know, we, we took presents and free holidays from the drug companies. We stopped all that. Cue Dr. Chris speaking to camera about the millions of pounds that pharmaceutical companies spend on marketing their products to doctors. Uh, um, no, 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 we're scientists, they said. We, um, we make decisions based on hard evidence about what will benefit patients. I can see some doctors in the room you know, nodding. Um, cut away to Dr. Chris explaining research that proves that doctors are more likely to prescribe a drug if they've received free stuff from the company. Cut back to the GP's office and you kind of pan around the, the free mirror and the free notepad and the free pen. Um, and then the really fun bit was the lunch. Um, the lunch. Every week the practice staff, they met for lunch and they discussed what um, new drugs to buy. Who pays for the lunch? said Dr. Chris. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> I'm one of the drug companies, but um, it doesn't influence our decision. It's just a free lunch. Um, in fact, we're saving the NHS money. You know, they don't have to buy us lunch. And I was fascinated because even as they were speaking, you could see the penny dropping. There is no way that a pharmaceutical company is going to pay someone to keep driving out to the East End every week to drop off lunch for 13 people unless they were getting a really good return on that investment. And as Dr. Chris just left the cameras rolling, you could see the good, conscientious, caring GPs realize that they had been bribed. They were making decisions. They thought they were in the best interest of the patient, or at least that they were neutral decisions with a free lunch, when really there were, there were two things going, or two things were benefiting. There was a big company making a load of profits and their own belly. That's what was benefiting. Two things were benefiting. Turns out that if you take people who work in one of the most caring professions and you give them a sandwich, you can bribe them hard enough that they will throw taxpayers' money at bad medical interventions. Now, like I said, I'm not a doctor, um, and tonight's sermon is not about medicine. Um, please don't stop taking the pills. Um, tonight's sermon is about bribery. Tonight's sermon is about bribery. We said last week that Micah is prophet of God at a time of crisis, a time when God's people need to hear a very, very serious warning. And when Micah stands up and speaks and tells the truth, he gets told to shut up. So 2 verse 6, turn back to the main verse we were in last week. 2 verse 6, do not preach. Disgrace will not overtake us. That's what they said to Micah. Shut up. Don't tell us the bad news. And uh, last week we talked about how we face a whole load of the same pressure in 21st century London. Here in London you can talk about God as long as that God does not care about evil and uh, will never do anything about it. I spoke to a, a school teacher yesterday who had to put together a school assembly about forgiveness without ever mentioning sin or anybody doing anything wrong. That's quite a good trick, isn't it? 
Don't, don't talk about all that. Don't say that. Shut up. And last week, we said that a lot of us Christians just say, all right. When, when someone says shut up, we say, oh, okay. I mean, I never really wanted to talk about that anyway. Fair enough. And I said that this week, Micah would tell us how we have been silenced. How we have been silenced. And how unkind we are. And um, uh, we've only got half an hour, but uh, when I started work on Micah chapter 3, here's the emotional journey from me. I, I read Micah 3, and I was astonished at how similar it was to all the kind of public Christian figures today that I think are kind of weak and spineless. And I, I just thought, this is amazing. It really speaks to them. And then I kept reading over a number of weeks, and I was astonished at how similar it was to me and the way I am spineless and silent. In fact, how much I am like those caring, well-intentioned doctors. You know, I think I'm making really careful decisions about when to speak and when not to speak. Um, I think I'm weighing up how best to help the person that I'm speaking to. Don't say too much too soon. It, it might put them off. Be careful. When the reality is, I have been bribed. And maybe there is a transaction going on between me and the culture, maybe even between me and the actual individual I'm talking to, and I'm benefiting, and they're benefiting, and everybody is happy. Because how much really can it matter if you distort what God is like and silence his message to the world? How much really can that matter compared to a sandwich? So let's look at the relationship in Micah's time. And we'll see if we can trace it through for them. So point one is about a relationship that suits everyone. And uh, Micah chapter 3, we're interested in the groups who run the capital city. In Jerusalem, we've got verse 1, the rulers or the heads. And uh, they run the law courts and control all the money. Then in verse 5, you have the prophets. And uh, they tell people what God is going to do next. And in verse 11, you get the heads, the prophets, and the priests who are there as the Bible teachers. Let me just read you verse 11. In Jerusalem, its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination, that's telling the future, for money. Yet they lean on the Lord. Micah says, you've all been bribed. And uh, we're in a a judgment section again in Micah's book. Um, And chapter 3 focuses in the same place as chapter 2, really. They focus on the strange silence of God's prophets. And here's how it works. Verses 1 to 4, the evil leaders, are really the same um, situation as last week. Uh, The heads, their job is justice, verse 1. But the way they act, well, they might as well be cannibals. I don't know if you thought, as Lexi read, those quite strong verses, aren't they? It's a metaphor. Those verses, it's a metaphor that the reality is much more um, suited and urbane than that. The reality is a a shady land deal and the the seizure of assets and then a a dodgy court verdict. I think probably the the chapter three people are the judges and the barristers who allow the chapter two people to get away with stealing all the land. But the effect, says Micah, well, you might as well just joint and bone their children and eat them. You might as well chop them up with cleavers and stew them. It's a metaphor, but um, here's how it goes. Judge Smith, um, you are well-fed and prosperous because the land barons, they bribe you. And the land barons, they have the money to give you because they have stolen it off the poor subsistence farmers with your help in court. And now mum and dad and granny and the kids, they're going to starve to death by the side of the road. Point being, you, you might as well cut out the middleman and just eat them. That would save everybody a whole lot of time. It was your job to protect the weak, your God-given job, and God is right to be angry about this. Verse 10, you are building Jerusalem with blood. That's the situation. But why... And um, why don't the God spokespeople, why don't the God spokespeople call you out? Why don't they say something about it? Well, why? Because you have paid them off in their terms. So evil leaders, 
verses 5 to 7, they find prophets that they can bribe. And uh, verse 5 is a, a bit of comedy. I think it's sort of profit as vending machine. Okay, so you stuff a sandwich in the machine, and out comes the message that you want. And it says, peace, peace to you. But of course, if you don't put the sandwich in, well, then uh, the machine gets angry, and you get judgment. Then they declare war on you. Verse 5. And uh, if that stark picture of bribery wasn't bad enough, I think there are the two details here that make it even worse. Um, first one, notice that in verse 6, when God judges those prophets for this, what he's going to do, he's going to take away their ability to see visions, which strongly suggests, doesn't it, that they are currently seeing genuine visions from God. Isn't that a thought? At least it says that um, you looking on would not have been able to tell the difference between them and the real thing. Uh, they have the same spiritual experiences, they have the same visions, they talk the same talk. Uh, they would be as convincing as Micah when it comes to what they're experiencing. Then uh, the second detail needs chapter 2, verse 6 last week. Um, chapter 2, verse 6. Do you remember last week, they told Micah off for talking about judgment. They said, talking about judgment, that is immoral. You should not talk about such things. Uh, disgrace won't overtake us. But then in 3 verse 5, you learn actually they're, they're quite happy talking about judgment. They're quite relaxed talking about judgment. They're quite happy to go to war with their mouths, but they won't do it for God. They will only do it for themselves. Uh, if you don't feed them, then you get a message of judgment, because that is what they're all about. And it's interesting how the New Testament applies the role of prophets into our age and our time today. There's a, an obvious line, I think, to people who are paid to represent a church and to senior leaders within churches and uh, people like bishops in particular. And it, it is interesting that in our denomination, in the Church of England, we will speak loads against the sins that everybody hates. So the Church of England has lots and lots and lots to say against um, damaging the environment. Loads to say against that, or, or loads to say against certain kinds of financial injustice that everybody hates. But the Church of England is much, much more cautious about sins that everybody won't talk about. Um, I don't want to tread to a stomp on a sensitive area, but um, the Church of England is completely silent, really, in the last 10 years on unborn babies uh, being killed and on the grief felt by their mothers, despite the lies of a culture that says, um, you know, you'll feel fine about that, nobody really minds, uh, you'll be okay. And um, silent on that. The, the, the Church of England, I said last week, um, joins in with... Um, drunkenness to an astonishing degree, really. Um, someone, after I said that, sent me a, a fresh Facebook picture of some, some vicars getting drunk. It's just kind of, that's normal. Um, and certainly on sex, uh, the Church of England is just chasing after our culture at speed. I don't know if you um, keep up on boring Church of England news, but there was a London vicar who resigned today in protest. And he was protesting that we were not changing the morals fast enough. He said, the Church of England cannot continue to claim a role in the national life if it is so at variance with the basic moral principles of the country. And he meant on sex. And I think he's probably right. He's a shrewd person. Um, there will come a point, won't there, when we can't go on enjoying seats in the House of Lords and palaces and titles like Reverend, that's my title, um, if we won't change the morals so that we agree with the new majority consensus, particularly on sex, I think. Um, so the question then becomes, well, how much do I want their bribe? How much do I want what they're offering? But um, before we get the boot in too thoroughly to bishops, let me tell you about Acts chapter 2, because in Acts chapter 2, it becomes clear that every single Christian is now a prophet. Um, I, I know more people have beards nowadays, but I don't know if all of you knew that um, you are a fully paid up bearded prophet if you believe in Jesus. We are all messengers of God 
inspired by his spirit to tell people his message. So I I wonder how you got on with last week's question. If you weren't here, I I asked us to think about what all our non-Christian friends would say if we asked them to describe our God, the God that we believe in. And I wonder, would they say, well, um, and I know that Charlie's God is fine with the way I live my life. Or would they say, um, Charlie's God doesn't really uh, want very much from me. I know, uh, apart from maybe to come to church a bit, I think Charlie's God would like it if I came to church a bit. So I I must be fine. Otherwise, um, my friend Charlie would have said something. And with Micah chapter 3 open, you can see that I'm going to ask us whether or not we are um, more than silent, whether we're actually bribed into silence. And uh, we'll think towards the end what our our sandwich might be. Um, But first, look at the difference. So point two. Um, Point two, the spirit-filled prophet speaks about sin. Uh, Micah is different. And why is that? We'll look at verse eight. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Why is Micah different? He's different because of the Spirit of God. Micah is different because of God. Um, It's really the the obvious other option, isn't it? So if you're going to be a a spokesperson, um, you can either speak for and follow the leaders of your culture, um, or you can speak for and follow God. Those are the two options. And Micah's experience is that God's Spirit brings him power. Um, I love the constant, constant realism in the Bible about how hard it is to speak for God. Um, Micah didn't find this easy because he was some kind of unhinged sociopath. Um, Micah found it hard, but he did it anyway because God gave him power. And the Spirit uh, filled him with justice and with might. And I think what that means there is it made, uh, the Spirit made Micah care about justice. It's the opposite of verse 9. The Holy Spirit of God, in his kindness, he made sure that Micah cared about justice, unlike the rulers who detested justice. Micah has a God given, Spirit given passion for justice. And that doesn't just mean um, social justice, the kind of issues in verses 1 to 4. It is the word for God's righteousness and God's passion against sin. So Micah has power and he has justice. And so what does he do? So he speaks about sin. It's really very straightforward, isn't it? Verse 8 if you're filled with the Spirit, you'll speak about sin. And when I read that, and I must have read this before, but when I read that this year, I couldn't believe that was Micah's test of the spirit-filled person. You know, is, that, is that verse really in the Bible? Why did nobody tell me that when I was a teenager? I, um, I lived through the years when we were all kind of most secure, about insecure, uh, about who was filled with the spirit and who wasn't. Uh, it was a kind of big deal when I was growing up. You know, do you have to have a certain spiritual gift and speak in tongues? Do you have to see visions? Do you have to have a, a certain kind of smile and a sort of happy peace? So, hey, that was it. That's how you told you were filled with the Spirit. That was it. Um, do you have to have victory over certain kinds of sin? Uh, do you have to be healed every time you get sick? Do you have to be rich? Though um, Three verses one to four, that's not looking very likely. Well, here is how you know. Here's how you know who is filled with the Spirit. The Spirit-filled person will be speaking about sin. Why didn't no one tell me that? When I was uh, nervously and clumsily trying to tell my friends the gospel, uh, when sometimes they were upset with me when I told them that, uh, why didn't I? I thought it meant I didn't have enough of the Spirit to do it properly. Because obviously you did it properly. You'd get the big smile and everything would go well. It is striking how many of my friends who most make a big deal about being filled with the Spirit are the least likely of my friends to talk about sin and judgment and hell. 
And I don't mean to say that I do that all the time and I find it really easy, but to claim that you are full to the brim with the Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, and not actually speak for him on the things that are difficult, I don't think Micah would have understood that. And uh, do you see how um, this would have gone down in Micah's Jerusalem? Do you see what the, um, the relationship between the prophets and Micah would have been like. So the prophets, they say peace if you feed them. And Micah says judgment and sin, whether you feed him or not. Um, can you see how much they are going to hate him? You see how much they're going to hate him. He's going to blow the whole racket, isn't he? Um, who's going to keep paying the prophets if word gets around that God doesn't change his mind based on how much you feed them? feed his prophets. Maybe God just knows about your sin. I wrote that down while Jamie was praying before I stood up. Um, God knows. Uh, It is miserable to try and fool God because it just doesn't work. And you can feed the sort of God experts as much as you like, but it doesn't change God's minds. And actually, it's been normal since Micah's day. You can track it through um, the Bible. You can track it through Jesus and the reaction he got from religious hypocrites. You can trace it through the apostles and the reaction they got when they spoke about the gospel. You can trace it through church history, and you can find it now today. If you speak about sin and judgment, it is religious people from your own religion who hate you most. That's the consistent picture all the way through. There is just a kind of normal settlement that religions reach with their culture and their governments. You've got to do a deal because it's too hard to live otherwise. There's a relationship, and it's a relationship that suits everybody. The relationship is we'll be religious in church, and we'll see your sin, and we'll tell you that you're fine. There's all sorts of different versions of that through history and around the world, but that is basically the deal. So you just get on with doing whatever you want, And don't you worry about what God thinks about it. And uh, all you need to do to keep that going, you just need to give us what we want. And then everybody is happy. And nothing, nothing blows the cover on that like someone who keeps saying what God has actually said rather than what everybody pays the religion for instead. So maybe, imagine the conversation, maybe they come to Micah and say, why have you got to be so difficult about this? This is going to cost us sandwiches. Uh, Why do you have to keep saying all this? And I think that's point three, and verses nine to 12, because God made no promise to defend, to vend evil. See, Micah says, I have to tell you about sin because it is true, because God knows everything. And he knows what you're really like, and he cares about that, which means this is true and this is urgent. It is life and death that I tell you what God is really like. And the the whole capital city is verse 9. They're all bribed and corrupt, the whole lot of them. But they say, verse 11, they lean on the Lord and they say, is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. When really, verse 12... Jerusalem is going to be so destroyed that you'll think it was just another farmer's field. You won't be able to find it. Uh, It'll just be a heap of ruins. And uh, we know when Micah said this, it's unusual with the prophets to know as much historical context as we do with this. We know Micah said this in 701 BC or just before because our Jeremiah reading tells us when he said it. So compared to last week, We've moved on about three decades. Uh, Last week, Micah was speaking when Samaria and Jerusalem, they were all still fine. And the shock is that what God announced against Samaria, that the godless, sinful city that God destroyed 10 years later, which is 21 years before Micah said our chapter, well, now he's saying the same thing to us. That's the shock. Because 3 verse 12 is almost identical to 1 verse 6. And as um, prophets with your beard on uh, and people who are going to speak for God, you have to make a decision about what you think God is really like. Uh, It's what we said last week. If you're going to speak for God, it matters what he is like. And verse 11, here's a theology about God to recommend. Um, They think we have a cast iron 
No time limit guarantee from God. Whatever we do, God will protect us because he lives with us. God's temple is here. He's in the midst of us. He's never going to let us be destroyed. He promised. That is what God is like to Jerusalem. We have a blank check God. And Micah says something different because he has a different God. He knows that that is a lie. God never promised that. Actually, he said the opposite. And bring it forward to today, the, um, the shock to religious English people might be that their uh, obvious stupid lie in Micah's day actually has so much more going for it than the modern equivalents. See, they, they really did have some reasons for thinking they might get away with this. They, um, they had the actual temple of God, where God actually lived, when we have cathedrals and, and churches designed to look a bit like the temple. And they had actual promises from God about their actual city. You know, the word Jerusalem or Zion comes hundreds and hundreds of times in the Bible, but I, I've been looking carefully for years and I, I've never found a mention of London. Do you know, I mean, don't say it too loud, but I, I wonder maybe whether there even was a London when Micah was writing. So how come English people, certainly um, English people my age, of my education and my class, how come they assume that God will defend them? no matter what they do, in this world or the next. What's the, the equivalent of verse 11? I know that God is mercy. He always forgets. That's God's job. Uh, God wants everybody to be in heaven in the end, doesn't he? Um, when there's even some pretty concrete events in history that show that God isn't like that, you can even do it with capital cities. In, in Mark 11, uh, those of you at RML may have done Mark 11 recently. Jesus stands in Jerusalem and he's able to point out that God destroyed Shiloh, where he put his temple or his tabernacle. Then he destroyed Samaria. Uh, then he destroyed Jerusalem. In fact, he destroyed it twice. And the Jerusalem that Jesus is standing in is going to be destroyed in a short period of time. And actually that happened exactly when Jesus said it would. And if he'll do that to Jerusalem... Um, what makes us think that um, being English somehow uh, is more special? Micah thinks that if God wants to warn people about their sin, well, then the kind and caring prophet really should tell them. So let me um, come back to the GP's surgery in East London for our last um, five minutes. Um, remember the GP surgery, remember their moment of realization. They're kind, they're considerate, they are caring professionals as they realized that bribery and corruption might be them. I don't know if you remember when uh, David Cameron was caught on camera talking about how fantastically corrupt uh, some world leaders in the room right behind him were. He didn't know the TV was still running. And that kind of arrogance that assumes that um, corruption is for other people and nothing to do with us. It's not at all part of my self-image that I'd be somebody who could be bribed. I, I'm one of the good guys. I'm one of the people who would turn down the brown envelope, even the clever ones, you know, the ones where they say the right thing out loud, but just put the brown envelope in your pocket so you find it later. I'd be, I, you know, I'd be wise. I'd check my pockets. I'd be up for that. But since reading Micah chapter 3, I've been thinking about some very, very normal conversations for me, very routine conversations, um, maybe something like this, where everything that's in public is all fine and clear, maybe. Somebody says, um, I, I think it's a bit extreme, isn't it, to talk about God's judgment and anger all the time. And you're, you're not one of those sort of Christians, are you? And I say something truthful. I say, no, I'm, I'm not one of those extreme Christians. I, I, you know, I think you do have to challenge people's conscience, but, um, but I'm not like those guys on the streets with the megaphones. Is, is that okay? I mean, I, mostly I'm not like those guys. I don't shout at people. I, um, I kind of whisper at them at most. Um, but what's really going on in that conversation, in that question and answer? I think there is a transaction there. I think there's a transaction where everybody is getting something that they want. Um, my friend, she can go on sinning. She can go on sinning, secure in the knowledge that God will protect her. I'm probably the most religious person she knows. I'm the God expert, and I said she was fine. And I get what I want. I get the self-respect, uh, the self-image, and the friendship. Yeah, I, I'm not one of those extreme Christians. Phew, I'm glad. 
Uh, I'm actually, I'm the kind of intelligent, thoughtful person that um, my mum paid my school to make sure I would be. And I, I guess you could repeat that conversation a thousand times, couldn't you, around this room? Every time a, a Christian moves into a new flat share with people who aren't Christians, every time a Christian gets a new job and settles into the new team, every time a, a friend uh, demonstrates in some way that they make decisions as if God wasn't real or God didn't care about sin and you, you don't quite look away fast enough so you think, oh, I've got to say something. Uh, what am I going to, they'll think I'm one of those judgmental Christians. What will I do? I'll, uh, I'll do the nervous smile and, uh, and we'll move on um, and we're okay. Because one day, one day I will get the gospel opportunity I've been praying for and I'll tell them the whole gospel. And uh, I, I don't mean to have easy answers here. I, I, don't want, I don't want that from now on the first words we ever say in a, a conversation have got to be the words sin, judgment, and disaster in any order you want from now on. But I think I do need to just rerun a whole load of conversations in my head and work out what was really going on. Um, there's a book that John Stott wrote a while ago that is called Our Guilty Silence. Our Guilty Silence. I haven't read it. Uh, it's in a, a list of books that I, ha I have that have brilliant titles, but I haven't read yet. Um, I think it's a brilliant title. Um, uh, but I've skimmed it, and I looked at the, the reasons he gives for how guilty we are, why we, we don't tell people about Jesus when it might do them some good. And as far as I can see from not having read it, um, he doesn't actually use this reason. Uh, he doesn't get close, actually, to the level of guilt that Micah is talking about. I wonder if I am not just silent because I am scared. Uh, certainly I'm not silent, really, because I'm pastorally sensitive. I'm silent because it suits me. Because I don't want that reputation, or I don't want to lose my job, and I don't want to face the anger. It turns out, actually, you don't even need to give me a sandwich. And just a smile will do, and we understand what's gone on. And the, the tragedy is that someone in this chapter, someone in Micah chapter 3, saves an entire city. I don't know if you, you put the pieces together from Jeremiah 26. Uh, somebody in this chapter saves an entire city. There are lots and lots of Christian movements around, different Christian movements that offer to love the city or serve the city or save the city. And I guess... Um, the prophets in Micah's day might have joined up with some of that. They really believe in Jerusalem. They value Jerusalem, the great city. Let's remember how much God loves us, Jerusalem. But Jeremiah 26, our first reading, quotes 3 verse 12, Micah 3 verse 12. That horrible, terrifying, negative, judgmental 3 verse 12. And uh, Jeremiah's book says that is the piece of speech that saved Jerusalem from the Assyrians. And we said in week one, Micah is kind of budget Isaiah, and since we're preaching uh, Micah, I feel I've got to kind of be on his team and, and, and stand up for him. And it turns out that it was one of Micah's sermons that caused the rescue in Isaiah 36 and 37, when the whole Assyrian army withdraws. Because grumpy Micah filled with the spirit Micah, he told them the truth, even though they would hate him for it. And do you know what they did? Uh, that year, in 701 BC, they repented. The king feared the Lord. They listened. They feared God. They turned, and he saved them. 3 verse 12 didn't happen because it did its job, and they, they turned to God, and he forgave them. So 3 verse 12 is how to save a city. It's how to love a city. You love a city by telling it the truth. And you wait to see if they'll turn back to God if you do. And uh, we think that our culture wouldn't do that. We think we're beyond people becoming Christians in our culture. But I wonder, could that be because we just haven't told them? And maybe we haven't told them because it suits us not to. Could it be we don't really want to save the city at all? Let me lead us in prayer, then I hope we will talk about some of these things afterwards. Father God, thank you that you are a God who knows all things, that when there is evil, um, we cannot hide it from you, we cannot um, pay somebody to be able to go on doing things that you hate. And thank you that you are a God who warns and tells the truth, and a God who waits to forgive 
who would love to forgive those who turn back to him. And Father, pray for us as people caught in the middle of that, who know you and know your message and your love and your truth, and yet fear to speak, and maybe even we are um, bought and don't speak. Father, please help us. Um, Reveal to us what we're like. Fill us with your spirit. Give us the power that we need that we could tell people about sin. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.